Okay, welcome back, everyone. Um, um, I'm happy to welcome uh, Renato Renner, who's uh, arrived here. So uh, uh, you will be hearing him uh, this afternoon, and I think for the each of the next three days, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. You won't hear me again. Well, we have a session now, and then you won't hear me again until Thursday. I hope you'll be very happy also on Thursday. Uh, uh, any, uh, well, let's see, how shall I say that? I was about to say any complaints, but uh, usually if that comes up, then I say we have to talk about it back there. But uh, uh, of course, if there are any complaints, uh, please uh, voice them. Uh, as far as scientific objections are concerned, uh, let's see, who was it here? Oh, yes. So you were asking me about uh, how, how really is it true that you can, uh, that Alice and Bob can distinguish these two Bell states by measurement? And, uh, well, I don't know, except that's the answer. Uh, I mean, I have to go back and read uh, this Walgate paper. But uh, I, I think these guys, uh, there's a series of papers, uh, as you see from some time ago. Um, but there was a series of papers over several years on this question and uh, this sort of entangled state version of this game, uh, game uh, because uh, the follow-up paper to this already goes into the question if there are more states uh, and larger Hilbert spaces and more than two parties, uh, you know, so there are many possible generalizations. Um, uh, I don't think there's, uh, well, I was discussing with uh, Renato earlier, this, these are not subjects that have been actively developed recently, but quantum information has already been through several, you know, I'd say generations of uh, of popular things. So these were popular. There were people working on these some time ago. Um, uh, I think they shouldn't be completely forgotten, even though they are, many of them remain in the status of sort of games, uh, just what if, or you know, if we uh, pose the following question, can we answer it? So sometimes it's just a sort of uh, exercise for your understanding of, uh, of you know, what you can do with quantum gates and measurements. So, um, so I'm going to continue. and. Uh, it just depends on how far I get, but I have two rather different uh, parts to this lecture. One is indeed about bound entanglement, but this is uh, following up on the UPB games. Uh, so this is maybe another good moment for a quiz. So bound entanglement I think of as another subject that uh, used to be very popular, used to be, you know, 10 years ago. Uh, was you would hear more about it and maybe not so much today, but in your lectures, bachelor or master lectures, have you heard about bound entanglement? Okay, uh, very few, just a small number, interesting. Um, okay, well, you'll learn something new, hopefully. Uh, and as I promised, it, in my view, it has something to do, um, uh, well, those of you who work on uh, sort of the, the future of quantum repeaters, you know, and I consider you know, uh, the Hansen lab or anyone who's working on uh, hi so-called hybrid systems, you know, uh, experiments involving uh, matter qubits and uh, optical qubits combined together. Uh, those, all, those experiments all point, in a sense, towards quantum repeaters or long-distance uh, schemes for communication of, of quantum information. And they also, therefore, require entanglement distillation, which maybe you have heard about. And in my view, uh, to have a good full sort of cultural background in entanglement distillation, you should know about bound entanglement. It's at least a, you know, a part of the larger story of entanglement, which uh, touches upon what can and cannot be distilled. In other words, what are and are not useful resources in things like quantum repeaters. So I'm giving a motivation for why this, uh, this sandbox, these little games that we're playing with UPBs, eventually do lead into some uh, some real, uh, some real life things, and then uh, I have promised a unit on superconducting qubits, so that will be something quite different. Um, that, of course, everybody's heard about, and throughout the course of the year, you'll have uh, many extensive lectures about this. But um, I want to at least get started, and this will be today and also on Thursday. Uh, I will also emphasize a little bit the sandbox at box aspect of it, which is maybe not so evident. I mean, uh, superconducting qubits are presently a very hot competitive field, and everybody's you know, straining to get nice results. And, uh, 
uh, you know, it all sounds very practical, but I think there, there is a sort of element of play in that as well, at least for me, and I'd like to uh, introduce it in that light. But we'll get to plenty practical things as well. Okay, so let's go back to um, the state that I had on the board, but I'll uh, write it again, of course. So remember the setting, we have this thing, uh, uh, we have these uh, dominoes uh, sitting here, and then this stopper. So we have these five states uh, whose properties uh, I discussed, or it's, you know, the, the collection of states, five states together, have this property of being uncompletable, of uh, having no further product states uh, um, present in the Hilbert space, and that led us to, to led me to write down this state. <coughs> um, so uh, there we are. Now I'm going to um, expand on this uh, a little bit. Well, some observations. So this I'll call this row Alice Bob. So this is some physical state that they could have in their possession. I mean, this, uh, this uh, super being, uh, uh, Charlie, could provide this state to them uh, in some manner. And so we want to ask a few uh, questions about it. So uh, first statement is this, uh, this is entangled. So row AB is entangled. Now, uh, perhaps I have to then state a little bit what I even mean about that. What do I mean uh, when I say a particular mixed state is entangled? Uh, if, it, if I'm talking about a pure state, a uh, uh, state representable by a state vector, then I can simply ask, so recall for, for a pure state, if it is so that I cannot write it as a product of an Alice part and a Bob part, I don't know, uh, A, B, um, uh, if it is not writable in that form, as a product form, then it is entangled. Uh, this is maybe somewhat of a matter of definition, but it's related to very operational things as well, uh, which maybe I'll come back to later. But it's in fact related to these LOCC protocols, that is, uh, that if you have a state which is not entangled, what can you do with it? And in fact, um, uh, any pure entangled state is usable in a quantum repeater protocol. So that to re relate it to some very concrete operational, uh, you know, situation. Uh, now, for a mixed state. Um, uh, there are various uh, criteria, but uh, let me state the f first one. Uh, this is a, uh, okay, we know that uh, row AB, quite as a general matter, can be written uh, in many different ways, and as an ensemble, let me call this P sub I, uh, psi I, let me use a different symbol here, phi, phi I, Uh, so, <clears throat> let's imagine as a mathematical operation that I write rho AB as an ensemble of states. Uh, now that's different from this. This was w a projector made one minus uh, this, but this is still some mixture of quantum states. And for example, it's this Eigen mixture uh, I could take. That is, uh, if with, I can take these probabilities to be one quarter, and then these just to be the eigenvectors of this state, but there are actually many, many other ensembles. Uh, but because there are no product states uh, left in this whole space, we know for sure that this representation must involve or does involve entangled states. Oops. Gold. Um, so in other words, there's no way to write this as a sum of product states. That's what we just got finished uh, saying. And uh, that is considered one criterion for a state to be entangled. Uh, and it's, uh, we refer to it as the sort of formation criterion. Um, this is again a kind of LOCC settings. We have Alice and we have Bob. 
And we suppose that they have, uh, um, uh, here's the way of thinking about it. They, they start out with a set of standard entangled states, say with some Bell states. And they want to go through some process, which I'll do some crisscrosses, meaning uh, classical communication, so LOCC. And they'd like to end up with a specimen, so these are psi bell. And they'd like to end up with a specimen of, say, row AB shared between them. And so uh, this is the sort of uh, a, a state formation process. That is, you start with some pure entanglement and you end up with a state which has some entanglement. But you can ask the question, what's the minimum number of Bell states that are needed in order to make a supply of these states rho AB? And uh, what we can show is that that, that supply, uh, we need a non-zero supply. So in the formation setting, or in, with the formation criterion, we can say that uh, uh, um, uh, some supply of, of, psi, of uh, psi bell is needed. And in fact, to quantify this, if you ask what's the minimum number, that's often taken as a, as a measure of the entanglement of these states. So you start with some number, some n, uh, some, say, some supply of bell states, and you want to end up with m of these. Um, you, as I said, you can take as a criterion, so the entanglement of rho AB can be, in some loose sense, taken to be equal to um, N over M. <clears throat> so if we can somehow kind of dilute this entanglement over many, many copies of rho, if it only takes like one Bell state to make a thousand rho ABs, then we would say these are not very entangled. Um, uh, but if it's almost one to one, then we'd say it's something rather highly entangled, that, uh, something close to fully entangled. Uh, actually, what I recall, I didn't, I didn't really prepare this, but I think that for this particular state, uh, for this UPB, you know, this uh, UPB complement state, uh, this row AB is actually pretty highly entangled. So. Uh, uh, something like let's 0.5 or something for a UPB state, UPB complement state. Uh, that's from some numerical studies and it's not very fundamental, but it uh, just says that uh, it's not that these are just slightly entangled. They, they seem to actually have a lot of entanglement. Um, but there are other criteria for uh, entang for you know the nature of entanglement for uh, for mixed states, and uh, the one that's of high interest is the inverse of this process. So this is formation, and that's to be set against um, distillation. and sort of considered to be the more of the real world setting. This is sort of a mathematical criterion for just giving you, an, giving you a mathematical, uh, uh, you know, a method of quantifying how entangled something is. Uh, but you can say, suppose I start with some supply of uh, mixed entangled states. So for example, rho AB. Again, we have N and M, but maybe we'll use different integers now. P, we have some number P of these. And then we go through some protocol, and this is, uh, this is really a distillation protocol, the kind that is talked about in, uh, in entanglement repeaters, uh, in uh, uh, quantum repeaters. And you want to end up, finally, with a state that you can use for teleportation, so a perfect, pure Bell state, uh, and we'll call this Q. And so there's a criterion, you know, the um, there's another measure of entanglement, uh, which we can call distillable, or the amount of distillable entanglement, which is very loosely speaking the ratio of these, um, <clears throat> Q over P. And uh, uh, you know, a large number, large here means that uh, you don't need a very large supply of rho ABs to make 
a, a lot of pure Bell states. Uh, now I may, I don't know if I'll come back to the question, how is it really possible to further purify? And, I mean, there are explicit protocols, but I was not planning on uh, talking about them. <clears throat> uh, because uh, the, the thing that's of interest here, just to give you the punchline, is that for this UPB state, <clears throat> this is equal to zero. So this uh, UPB complement state is undistillable. So it's an example of, um, uh, well, uh, it had been previously understood that these two numbers didn't have to be the same. In other words, that this is not a reversible process, uh, that there is in fact some loss, uh, some uh, you know, loss of efficiency in a sense involved in first forming um, uh, mixed states, which involve interaction with the environment, that's somewhat the clue, and then going back again to recreate Bell states, there is loss in that cycle. Uh, it's actually, in a sense, a subject of quantum thermodynamics, although I think uh, Renner will talk about uh, more modern or other aspects of quantum thermodynamics. But this is a fundamental irreversibility of uh, concerning multi-party entanglement. And this state shows it in an extreme form. And that is, you can make it, but once you've made it, uh, you can't get the entanglement out. So that's the meaning of the word bound entanglement. Uh, and uh, this was, was actually not the first state that was understood as being bound and tangled, but it's in some sense the cleanest. Uh, it's, um, you know, kind of the reason for its being undistillable is actually quite clear once you go through a few steps, which uh, we, will, we will go through now. <clears throat> so, um, let me find my notes about this again. Let's see. Oh, yeah. Good. So uh, to do that, we have to learn about another um, measure of entanglement that was introduced, uh, again, back in these times. So we're talking about the, the ancient uh, 2000s and even the, uh, even the previous century. Um, uh, which is another simple mathematical uh, test of entanglement, very f kind of physically motivated or motivated by physical considerations. Uh, let's see, where will I? I've been use I'm using a lot of board space, so I want to immediately clean up. Um, <clears throat> so uh, we're going to talk about the so-called partial transpose test. So um, it was introduced by Perez. Um, so that's another instance where I can ask, have people heard about the partial transpose test? Uh, experimentalists probably not, but uh, okay. So it's still a reasonably uh, popular uh, uh, thing to, to talk about. <clears throat> so, um, so first of all, what's the point? Uh, well, transpose, by transpose, I just mean regular matrix transpose. So, um, uh, but partial transpose has something to do with, you know, looking at only Alice or Bob. So first of all, let's do regular transpose. I just want to do it by some examples. And it's something you apply only to mixed states. Uh, so if you have a pure state, you first make a density matrix out of it. So for instance, here's, um, well, the title is partial transpose, or the Perez criterion. Partial transpose. Okay, so uh, example. So I state I begin with the uh, state vector um, uh, phi, which is equal to one of my usual states. But I'm going to throw in some uh, some i's just to make it interesting. So this is zero plus i one. Now the density matrix of that, of course, is uh, 1 i minus i 1. Uh, I think I've got the minus sign in the right place. I hope so. Uh, anyway, of course, it has to be Hermitian. So uh, that's, that's a Hermitian uh, matrix. Now, of course, OK, now the transpose of that is just transpose, right? You just uh, interchange the two diagonal elements. And a full transpose of a density matrix is just also its complex conjugate. That's that's the, you know, the meaning of it being uh, Hermitian 
uh, being a Hermitian matrix. Uh, it does mean, however, that if rho is a if rho is a legal quantum state, then rho transpose is also a legal quantum state, or it just says uh, starring a quantum state and putting a minus sign here is a different state, but uh, but a possible one. Uh, now we'll encounter in a moment a setting where a different kind of transpose leads to something which is not a state. So let's do that as an example immediately. So let's do the Bell state. Um, so we're going to do uh, let's do a standard Bell state which is um, zero zero plus one one, and let's write it in matrix notation. Uh, <clears throat> um, one half. Uh, well, I, I, you know, I multiply it out so that it's a matrix. So let's spend a few moments writing some zeros here. Oops, there's a one here, of course. Um, so those of you who do tomography know that you know you really spend a lot of time chasing after these off-diagonal elements. Of the, uh, of the matrix. Now, the transpose of this is itself, because this is a real matrix. But I'm going to introduce a so-called partial transpose. And uh, well, there are a few ways of saying it. But it's basically you pick either Alice or Bob, and you say uh, they're going to do the transpose, but Alice not. Uh, now, what that means as a, just as a matrix operation, there are other ways of saying it, is to divide this up into little sub-matrices. In these, in these particular two by two submatrices, and transpose, but just within the submatrices. So the partial transpose of this on, I forget the Alice or the Bob side, is explicitly the transpose of these two by two submatrices. I could have put transposes on these as well, the diagonal blocks, but they're already, well, I should, in fact, because for the complex cases, uh, they will do something interesting. But for this case, not. These are transpose invariant. So that's one you know, concrete statement about what partial transpose is. Um, and you can see, it, so in this case, partial transpose of this gives me a matrix of this form, 1, 0, 0, 0. Uh, I hope with all this erasing and so forth that this is actually visible. There's a 1 here uh, from transposing this. And then this is still a Hermitian matrix, so there's a one there. <coughs> okay, so that gives you this matrix. Now, is that the density matrix of any state? Uh, well, if I tell you, forgot to put the zero here. So with these ones here, uh, it forms a sort of one, a two by two block by itself here, once I've done that. And now the eigenvalues, I have to make more space. Uh, well, this is not, in fact, a density matrix of any state um, because it has some negative probabilities. <clears throat> so um, in particular, if you look at the, uh, so the eigenvalues of that matrix, just some elementary calculation, the eigenvalues of this row uh, after partial transposition are uh, a bunch of one halves and then a minus one half. <clears throat> so it is not a physical state. Now, uh, uh, Perez introduced this uh, with a quite physical notion, um, which was that because um, uh, this transposition or complex conjugation is sort of like, uh, or is one statement of time reversal. You know, of the physical operation or of the mathematical operation of, uh, of reversing the direction of time. So you have Alice with her time vector going this way, and Bob, of course, is in the same world. He has the time vector going the other way, but you reverse the direction of time. And if there are no correlations between Alice and Bob, then the, sort of there's no harm done. You can, you can describe Bob's world in a time reversed manner without any, any real problem of in inconsistency. But the problem that Perez observed is that if, uh, if these are part of some entangled system, then you get physically inconsistent things by reversing your arrow of time only in half of, the, uh, of this uh, picture. And that, that's manifest in this mathematics. 
So a, a further observation is, so which goes along with this, is if, if the state of Alice and Bob is a product state, then this never happens. So uh, example, or not really example, you just say, um, so consider the case of row product, Uh, which I will just write as, <clears throat> so there's a Alice state, a Bob state, and I make a, a projector out of that. Uh, just notationally, I can pull this apart into an Alice projector times a Bob projector. And then I can state what I mean by partial transposition. So row product pt, in this way of writing the mathematics is just, uh, I'll do it on the Bob side, is just to do ordinary transposition on uh, this, this is just, you just do an ordinary transpose on this object, and that just produces, um, that just does this complex conjugating. Now, putting this star in this symbol uh, requires a little comment. It just means that if you write this Bob state in some fixed basis, you know, 0, 1, 0, 1, 2, you just complex conjugate the coefficients of the state vector in that basis. So, but that's still definitely a legal state, so that it means that this rho pt, the way we summarize that is that uh, this is clearly uh, uh, this operator after partial transpose, if it's a product state, it's clearly positive, meaning it only has positive eigenvalues. So this was introduced by Perez as a as a possible, you know, interesting criterion for um, for entanglement, and it immediately had a very concrete uh, operational significance, which I can uh, point to here. <coughs> that. Um, uh, I mean, it, it turns out you can prove something about its, uh, uh, the, uh, what happens to partial transposition under distillation, so under LOCC. Uh, and the only thing I need from that is that if, let's see, how do I want to say it? The positivity or negativity, no, well, let, me, let me be careful to say it. Um, if uh, if rho a b is positive, rho, sorry, I need a little more space here. If I consider the starting state and I do a partial transposition and it's positive, like it would be for a product state, um, then whatever the final state is, say, just call it rho final, is also positive under partial transposition. So you cannot uh, create uh, this, uh, you cannot create uh, correlations corresponding to this negativity merely by talking on the telephone. Uh, so it shows that if you start, well, it's obvious here, if you start with a product state, you can't, up, can't end up with a Bell state. Uh, if that, uh, because if you did, the Bell state has a, has a negative eigenvalue, and you can't create it out of nothing just by, uh, by creating some classical correlations between Alice and Bob. Now, that wouldn't be so interesting if the only states that had this property of uh, this positivity were just literally product states. Um, but now I'll show you in a few lines that the, uh, this UPB-derived state also has this property, even though it has, it is very entangled by other criteria and is very uh, expensive to make by the, uh, by our measures of entanglement, but, um, uh, but it in fact has no entanglement with respect to this resource, with respect to this Perez resource. So let me do that, and that only takes a few lines, so that's uh, quite an easy little derivation.
So I should have left it up because uh, a lot of it's just having this form available. Now I, I'm going to just add a little bit to this. Okay, I hope you can read that. I've just written out the expression I've written a few times, uh, this one quarter, this one minus projector. And the only thing I've done, I'll call this the UPB state, or it's the UPB complement state. I've, only, I've just uh, notationally made it clearer that this collection of five states are all product states. Okay, but now I can just proceed. This, uh, if I do this partial transpose, so I reverse the arrow of time for Bob, um, I can use ordin my ordinary matrix rule for this identity, and that, that remains unchanged by doing the partial transpose. So, but that, um, that's just identity itself. And then uh, this, as I said, the rule for this kind of expression even though it's embedded inside a mathematical expression, but we just use a linearity fact, that even though it's part of this bigger, um, uh, bigger projector, that this partial transpose operation acts linearly, so it acts on every term inside this summation, and it leaves the A part unchanged. And uh, it just, uh, well, I'll do this in two, I'll do this a little briefly. If I do the transpose here, but these are all real valued states. So uh, it's unchanged. So even though this is entangled, I can reverse the arrow of time and Bob and nothing happens to this state. So rho PT is the same as the uh, matrix itself. So and therefore, of course, it has positive eigenvalues. Uh, so um, the, these, uh, well, and this is one of the main ways that people show that uh, entanglement can exist but be bound in the sen same sense as in thermodynamics, that uh, energy can be bound and not free. Uh, entanglement can also be free, in other words, available for distillation, but also uh, completely unavailable for distillation, even though it exists. Um, and this was somehow kind of a surprise in that uh, it was known, there were a few states previously known which at least remained positive under, uh, you know, didn't flip their eigenvalue under partial transposition, but it was very special. And this, for example, this can't happen for qubits. Uh, there's a state which, um, uh, which actually even remains invariant, means completely unchanged by this uh, partial transpose operation. So, uh, that's actually pretty much the end of uh, this sandbox uh, part of this lecture. I, uh, I had in mind talking about one other uh, uh, sort of game from quantum information, which also relates to actually teleportation. But I think I'll skip that. Uh, I think I'll proceed on to uh, sort of get going on my lecture concerning superconducting qubits. So I really a change of gear at this point. Uh, so probably I'll warn you, expect for those of you doing the work for credit, expect a homework about the subject that I've just uh, covered. Uh, Tilo. Uh, usually we know that uh, the trace, uh, the transpose operation is dependent on the base of the qubit. Yes. Mm -hmm. Is that a Yes. Uh, a very good observation. Uh, yes, uh, the, uh, what you can show is that uh, partial all partial transpositions in any basis are related by local unitary operations. So they do not change the eigenstructure uh, in particular. So this positivity or not under partial transposition is an invariant. So yeah, excellent uh, observation. Uh, it wouldn't make sense very well otherwise. Um, but it's somehow related, I mean, the mathematics of this turns out to be rather related to the mathematics of time reversal invariance, which has some similar discussions, you know, that sometimes you say 
uh, to do time reversal on a quantum state, you complex conjugate. And you have the same question, in fact, in what basis? And you have to understand that the properties of importance that you're discussing with time reversal invariance are not affected by the choice of basis. <clears throat> so that's a bit of real theoretical physics, um, uh, some of those uh, considerations. So uh, let me go on. Uh, well, any other questions um, about this? Uh, I've, I've been looking to strike some balance and not uh, completely bore the uh, more practical ones of you. but. Uh, uh, but anyway, we're finished with, uh, with UPBs for the time being. Um, okay, so I have, um, I, I'm starting, I, I had to decide where to start, and I'm not sure this is the best place to start, but I want to start with something very complicated, in fact, and then strip it down and uh, sort of talk about the process of stripping it down um, because, uh, uh, so, and I think uh, I'm mostly now going to be on, uh, on view graphs here. Um, so this is supposed to be a picture of a quantum computer, you know, a real one that's really functioning that, uh, you know, will factor big numbers and whatever. And um, uh, it's only a little piece of it in that uh, the qubits are these uh, green dots. So this, okay, it's a little schematic. Uh, but uh, if you count, uh, there's, uh, this picture is meant to convey many thoughts, so I'm going to spend a few uh, minutes on it. Uh, so the green dots are qubits laid out in a two-dimensional structure. It happens that they're, they're all in groups of four here, and there are nine groups. So there are 36 qubits in this, uh, in this diagram. And uh, that's not perhaps, <clears throat> well, that's not what we're doing in the lab today. But if, you know, if the plans that we were chatting about at the beginning come to pass, then within a few years, uh, this will, you know, a device of this complexity should be functioning in the lab. Um, uh, that, that doesn't only go for, you know, the uh, ETH and uh, Delft uh, transmon systems, but, you know, there are plans I could show you from, from our local work in, uh, in quantum dots that uh, at least show pictures that say, here's how we will scale it up and sort of scale up to this, to this scale. Um, now, there's, in fact, a particular reason to think about regular two-dimensional layouts, uh, which is basically Barbara Terhal's subject, about why regular two-dimensional layouts are especially effective as the sort of uh, 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 kind of the fabric of quantum computing, and it has to do with the effectiveness of error correction. But I'm not going to get that into that here. I just want to explain a few other aspects, though, of this diagram that um, the, it has many sort of practical considerations in, behind it, although in, in fact uh, there are also rather impractical things such as the fact that qubits are merely green dots. Um, uh, but they are, um, they're all in the vicinity of these um, light bars, and this has to do with the coupling strategy. So there has to be, you know, methods of entangling qubits, of uh, having this qubit and like that qubit participate in a gate operation. And uh, you wouldn't like them not to be so very close together. Uh, there are a few, well, uh, what does that mean? Uh, I mean, they shouldn't be at atomic distances, but anyway, these qubits are not atomic size. Um, but they should be rather further apart than their own physical size because other things have to fit on this chip. So, you know, we have kind of a rule of thumb that we ought to go sort of micron scales, micrometer scales, with the ability to do gate operations between two qubits. Uh, we also know it's not necessary, and this is the message we get from topological uh, error correction, is that we need, it, there's no need to do a gate, direct gate operation between this qubit and the qubit, you know, over here somewhere, that these things are relatively well localized uh, in a, in a sort of uh, uh, lattice sense. That is that it's fine if this qubit only be able to participate in gate operations with the s some of its neighbors. And the rule of these uh, transmission lines, which I'll get into a bit in this lecture and on Thursday, is that if a qubit is, um, you know, to a significant degree, you know, is designed to be coupled to that coupling structure, to that transmission line, 
uh, then all the qubits that are so coupled uh, can participate in two qubit gates. So in this particular geometry, this bar, which I'm, I'm using to denote, say, a transmission line resonator, but there are other possible couplers that, could, that this could represent. Uh, all four, so there are four qubits that are coupled to this bar, two at the ends and two somewhere along the middle, um, that they can all, you know, there, you can devise protocols so that any one of those four qubits can couple to any one of the other four and participate in a controlled knot operation or a controlled phase operation. Um, and so if you look at any particular qubit, it's coupled to two resonators. So it has three qubits, you know, if I focus on this one, it has these three qubits up here, and the three qubits spread along this resonator uh, that it can pot potentially participate in entangling operations. And that turns out to be enough. Um, now, there are details, you know, why this particular layout? Well, there are a few answers to that. Uh, when I chose to write this down, I, I was very concerned to be conservative, that is, to imagine that uh, it would be expensive to you know, bring a physical coupler into, you know, into contact, so to speak, with a qubit. So these, this is very economical in the sense that it only involves two. That is, this, is, uh, this qubit is participating in this coupler and in this coupler and not in others. Uh, and more, I'll say, naive or direct ways of implementing square lattices involve four couplers per, uh, per qubit. So this is just more economical. Yeah, Tobias. They're physical, yeah. Why would you, do, why would you need to do um, two qubit operations between them? Um, I well, thought, I thought the, the scheme to have a logical scheme is to have holes in that loop. Um, well, okay, th these are physical. Did I say otherwise? That these are the physic. These are physical qubits, correct? Um, I mean, of course, we should distinguish. If your physical qubit is two dots, uh, which is quite possible, then this is each of these green dots is two quantum dots, or it could even be three quantum dots. So there are cases, even for superconducting qubits, there are cases where sort of twin transmons, you know, two transmons fused together forms an interesting qubit. Okay, but now the logical, how you do logical operations on this is a sort of question for a different level. Um, and, uh, well, holes can be the story, but there are actually other ways as well. But uh, for really large-scale quantum computing, we think you need patches this big or bigger before you even discuss the uh, sort of the, op the logical operation at the algorithmic level. So everything at this level, all 36 qubits, are participating in kind of a low-level uh, uh, set of operations, uh, like error correction, massive, massive redundancy error correction. Okay, I'll mention a few other things in this picture that you're all sort of schematically done. There's another sort of zigzaggy line here, which uh, you see every qubit has such a structure. And that's just to evoke the idea, uh, which is that each qubit uh, uh, needs to be measured. You have to have a means of measuring every qubit. Now, whether it's every single qubit needs a high, you know, high fidelity measurement is, a, is another detail. Maybe not all of them need it, but a lot of them need it. And uh, at least in superconducting practice, uh, uh, cu coupling to another resonator, to a local resonator, is a way of, of uh, measuring. You measure the shift of the frequency of that resonator. Now there are details in their multiplexing strategies where that resonator can touch several qubits and, uh, you know, the, the uh, dispersive shift, so to speak, of uh, each qubit can be recorded in parallel. So this is not assuming any parallelism in that respect. Uh, typically, also, every qubit needs some other kind of control, some microwave signal or po pulsed signal. So another little symbol is, made, is shown here. Uh, the, the, the common thing, there are, there are these things uh, which are yellow squares, uh, uh, maybe slightly hard to distinguish from the green circles, but this yellow squares are meant to evoke a, the idea that there's a place where classical information has to go in and out of this chip. So uh, for this one, it's some interrogation tone that would read out, uh, you know, the phase shift of this cavity and therefore read out the zero one state of this qubit. And for this one, it would be some uh, current pulse, say, that would, would change some, some flux bias of a qubit if it's some flux controlled transmon 
or, uh, but you can read uh, your own thought for other kinds of, of, uh, of qubits. This is not, uh, well, this was drawn for, certainly for superconducting qubits, but it has, I think, many aspects that at least illustrate points that are beyond superconducting qubits. Many other solid state qubits, and in particular quantum dot qubits, have uh, all very common uh, uh, features. Um, the other thing which was always meant to scare people, and I think is still meant to scare people, is that every one of these dots, has, every one of these green squares has to come out as a separate channel, uh, sort of information carrying channel to the rest of the world. And that's both a space problem, like where do you, where do you find the room to contact this? And that the idea has always been, always, I mean, since these were, ideas were written down, had to be the third dimension somehow involved. Um, <clears throat> And how do you have enough hardware in the lab to address and monitor and measure every single one of these? Well, I don't know. That's where quantum computing gets incredibly expensive and complicated and engineering-like. Um, but well, we're not quite there yet. Um, uh, but I think there's a, there's a message that such complexity, such high classical complexity is impossible to avoid. Um, at least that if you have error correction, if the system needs error correction, then it also needs this very high complexity as a classical device, as, a, as, a, as an apparatus. Now, maybe Barbara will tell you that, I mean, there are possible uh, theory ideas that would get around all that, that have to do with ideas of so-called passive quantum memory, where you don't actually have to interrogate the system so frequently in order to successfully uh, keep the system on track and keep it, uh, keep it error corrected. Uh, but most of the results, the big results in that field have been negative results, saying why you can't do uh, effective sort of passive quantum memory, that you really need active intervention into the, into the quantum system in order for it to, to, evolve, um, to evolve in a coherent fashion. So I'm skimming over a lot of the, you know, the, the underlying reasons why you do all these things. In a sense, as I said, that gets into the subject of error correction. Probably all of you had at least some basic lectures of error correction. I won't do the show of hands, but I'm, I'm certain that you've all done the three qubit code. Uh, uh, I don't know, the Steen code. Uh, everybody know the Steen code? Uh, uh, OK, so yeah, pretty much. OK, so um, and everybody's tending to know the surface code now of these days. So this was meant to evoke the surface code. Now, I wanted to dig down, because uh, theorists, theorists play at many points in this work, and this is a piece of theory. You know, now, it's meant to be close to experiment in the sense that, well, you know, one to first build this, and then you build that, and then you build a little bit more, and you build up a whole, you know, thread by thread, you build this fabric. Um, but of course, there's a lot unsaid here. Um, I would like to reveal that this was actually also a sort of sandbox work in that uh, where this lattice came from, I mean, why this particular arrangement of big squares and little squares and things like that. Well, as I said, there was a very serious purpose, which is to figure out how to have enough con connectivity, but only have each vertex <coughs> participate in two, e each uh, qubit participate in two resonators. Uh, but I, I when I was first doing this and I showed it, there were a few people who caught me and said, well, you actually just took this from a proof of Pythagoras' theorem. And that is absolutely true, that uh, that, that was in, in fact how I myself came to this idea of big squares and little squares, but it was by remembering that in geometry you, you make such pretty pictures in order to prove that a squared plus b squared equals c squared for right triangles. And um, well, this isn't the whole thing, but let's see, th this is some, uh, well, it turns out this is some uh, pattern from uh, 1,200 years ago in I Islamic art. But to get the qubits, you have to erase the dark lines. And you get left with these uh, lighter tiles. And then you have it each, uh, see, uh, let's see if I can illustrate. <clears throat> so along each line segment, uh, one, two, three, four meeting points, each one being a T-junction. So, uh, so this is a lattice with the right attributes. Uh, to, uh, to do the necessary geometrical job. Um, now, fine, but uh, okay, whether this really survives, you know, whether we actually have these, uh, these 
uh, Islamic art tilings as part of our large-scale quantum computers, I think that's a much rougher uh, criterion. That is not merely uh, beauty and uh, historical interest that will uh, lead us to uh, whether these chips are made in this way. Uh, but it it's at least gets the, gets the thoughts rolling. Now I want to dig down a few uh, levels <clears throat> and um, uh, talk about, so there are many, many routes to go with this discussion. Uh, one is perhaps to uh, say a few things about where these structures came from. This was, uh, I mean, now everybody does them well. It seems like everybody lectures about them and knows about them. But uh, it was only in 2004 and five that uh, this notion of qubit cavity coupling became, you know, one that was clearly a valuable thing to be doing. I mean, of course, it had, it had clear uh, predecessors in atomic physics, I should say. So in that sense, it was not at all a new piece of physics that coupling an atom to an electromagnetic cavity was, uh, was a very traditional uh, or very well-established piece of science. <coughs> but it was only this work done at Yale about 10 years ago that showed that, uh, well, that all of that thinking could be transposed to the microwave band of frequencies and that something which you would think of as a kind of ordinary electrical transmission line um, could first of all, well, could be made into a cavity. That by itself is no surprise. That is, uh, you make a, a transmission line, but well, first of all, we're using thin film techniques. So as you can make transmission lines right on a chip with the right kind of metal layering. It's just, a, it, it's just uh, well, the point is just to have um, a uh, solid conducting uh, surface and you um, etch or saw or whatever two uh, slots in it. So two, uh, you remove metal in two places and uh, then, then there's, a, there's a wire of metal in between that's otherwise disconnected. So the transmission line, is, uh, transmission line consists of two wires, the, the two conductors, the inner conductor and then the total of the outer conductor, that is the, all the bulk conductor surrounding it, is sort of the ground conductor of this transmission line. So, and these transmission lines are very versatile. You, you can, you know, so they bend them back and forth, but uh, the bending doesn't really do much to the physics of the guided radiation. <clears throat> so the bending is just so you can use less space, basically, in applications like this, so that you effectively have a transmission line that's uh, as long as the straightened out version of this string. So it's maybe twice as long or three times as long as the distance from here to here. <clears throat> uh, but that distance is basically a pretty ideal one-dimensional transmission line. And then by putting a break, and as you see, these breaks are not always straight. They can be crooked or something because you want to control how much coupling there is to the outside world. But there's a break here and a break also here, which is not uh, highlighted. And that, uh, that region constitutes a clo closed region so that there's mostly reflection. In other words, radiation that's traveling along here reflects here and so reflects multiple times. And that's a setup for having a, a, a cavity. And it means that the quanta of radiation, the photons of, uh, of that cavity at that frequency are legitimate, actually highly coherent quanta themselves. They don't by themselves constitute qubits, but they're another tool for uh, manipulating and controlling qubits. Now, this, uh, now in this experiment, um, <clears throat> which I don't even remember which, there were, there were papers in various places, and I know it mainly from this archive, but I, archive uh, place, but I don't know which of those it uh, corresponds to, I think to the physical review letter. Uh, yes, from the dates it must be. Um, so right in the middle, uh, they put a, uh, what is today a really old-fashioned style of qubit. Uh, this is actually a so-called Cooper pair box. Actually, the only uh, research I am aware of this year that uses Cooper pair boxes is at Delft on uh, uh, trying to control the quasi-particle physics of um, some compound superconductor. I don't know if any of you are involved in that experiment with Kauenhoven, uh, but that's for the purpose of trying to hybridize it with nanowires and make Majorana qubits. So that's a whole other story about how, I mean, why people are still sometimes making these so-called Cooper pair boxes, which are otherwise rather old-fashioned and not very coherent uh, styles of qubit. But it's basically a squid, um, you know, it's a 
loop of superconducting metal with two Josephson junctions uh, at these places. <coughs> and um, it is sensitive to or coupled to the electric field uh, of, the, uh, of the photons, basically, or, uh, well, of the normal modes of this cavity. So uh, some of the normal modes have a strong electric field from this conductor to this conductor in this region. So it's an antinode of electric field. And that couples to, I mean, you can say it influences the properties of the qubit, but it means also there's a coupling Hamiltonian, uh, coupling this transmission line to this uh, superconducting structure. And this qubit, which was otherwise very noisy, I mean, it was, it's highly sensitive to electrical noise, but uh, this setup actually shields it from most of the noise of the outside world, because uh, any electrical noise that comes from the outside world, from this port, um, unless it's uh, within a very narrow band of frequencies corresponding to the resonance of this cavity, it gets reflected. So that was already a very valuable sort of zeroth order um, suppression of noise for this qubit. And uh, so this qubit in all, in previous experiments, you know, not surrounded by this cavity structure, had a coherence time of a few nanoseconds, so down at this, at, down in this scale. Whereas here, it's the Ramsey experiment shows you know, hundreds of nanosecond coherence times. And that's been further improved. I mean, there's a far better qubit to start with than the Cooper pair box. Um, but the further improvement has just been, well, has been a few more orders of magnitude. So it's been quite a bit. But this was, in fact, the, in a sense, the biggest single jump in order of magnitude coherence, you know, factor of 100 all in one shot by adopting one other, one new aspect to the physical structure. <clears throat> so that's why um, you know, there's a feeling that you know, when you build further, you should uh, build cavities around everything or use cavities extensively. And in the, well, the five qubit chip, uh, that, that, of course, that, that strategy is not being universally adopted, but definitely the five qubit chip uh, at Delft is very much using that strategy with now two uh, uh, two cavity buses, and it can be stated as a small fragment of, uh, of this uh, structure. <clears throat> okay, but um, so that's a little bit about the uh, connection between uh, theory and reality. Um, I want to now step to another aspect of it, which is, <clears throat> you know, the, the main standard step that we take in order to make sense of this, to really start being able to calculate properties and you know, make estimates of behavior. Uh, but I'm actually going to mainly spend time, mostly uh, later in the week, uh, discussing the problems with uh, this very standard uh, uh, piece of theory. Uh, so, uh, okay, let me do this as a, uh, again, as a little quiz. So, how many of you do know the Jaynes Cummings model? Yes, good. Okay, so this is becoming very standard fare. Uh, uh, you know, modern day master's lectures couldn't do without it, uh, definitely. Uh, and uh, well, it, it's worth, I, I want to examine the derivation uh, a little bit. Uh, but in a sense, the trouble starts even before the derivation. Um, the trouble is a little bit, well, in my opinion, the trouble or something worth examining in the present time is this squiggly equals, um, because this already represented a sort of model step that went unquestioned but is now increasingly being trouble, is being troublesome. So I'm actually going to spend some time talking about that as a really contemporary problem in quantum information. Now, what's the trouble? Now, uh, I mean, what does this all mean anyway? <clears throat> so this diagram, I should say that I, I did not go to any big trouble that, uh, in the sense that I took this from, uh, because I, I said this is an extremely standard thing, I'll find a very standard reference. So Alexandre Blay has a very, very beautiful set of lecture notes, and this is just a page from that, from that lecture note. Um, okay, now uh, this part of this diagram is meant to depict the qubit. And, uh, well, now it's, it's somewhat of a matter of taste. Is the qubit the whole thing, or is the qubit just this? Um, so this x is, uh, you know, the Josephson junction. And uh, it's a very minute, well, now it depends. There are, nowadays, there are many transmon qubits uh, 
where there is indeed only one physical junction where there's no squid. <coughs> and so you can really identify this little symbol, which corresponds to this piece of mathematics, corresponds to that um, relationship between uh, the phase difference between the two super superconducting uh, metals and the energy of the system, this cosine behavior. Um, but that's a summary of something that goes on at a very microscopic scale, you know, sort of nanometer, well, 10, 100 nanometer scale in this structure. <clears throat> and that is, you know, arguably very much the core of this qubit. And I'm actually not going to argue too much with that as a good premise. Although, um, uh, well, in another direction, this is also getting called into question. I mean, uh, there is the physics of quasi-particles and superconductors that actually makes this a bit of a new story but I was not going to explore that in these lectures, but it's another contemporary uh, subject, is uh, calling this uh, part of this energy expression into question. The rest of it, you'd think, is way less controversial because it's all, well, quote, classical uh, electrical physics. Uh, so this object, uh, this is just a fancy picture for a capacitor, uh, and it's meant to remind you of the fact that, I don't know if I have a better picture of it than this, but. Uh, the uh, transmon has a purpose-built capacitor of relatively large capacitance value uh, surrounding it. And uh, the, the, the cartoon is just to remind you that physically it's, it get, achieves a fairly high capacitance by so-called interdigitating. That is, the two conductors are, have little fingers which, uh, which go uh, between each other to make for a high capacitance. Uh, what's amusing is... Uh, well, this, this, uh, lecture, these lecture notes were three or so years ago. Uh, this is going out of style, actually, because it's been learned that uh, with this, which takes some extra processing to make, goes along with it uh, relatively highly concentrated electric fields, and which also seems to t tend to go along with a substantial amount of dielectric loss. So in fact, these qubits are lossy, and it's found it's better to make the qubit just longer, or the capacitor longer and flat. So the absolute textbook capacitor seems to be better for coherence. So uh, this cartoon, which was supposed to evoke a key feature of the experiment, is now going away. But that's, I'm not quibbling with that so much. Uh, the statement is the, capa the capacitor ought to be there. And um, well, it's actually, it's hidden a little bit in this expression. It's uh, E sub C N squared. <clears throat> so E sub C, or you know, it's a capacitive energy. It's proportional to Q squared, in other words. And uh, there are arguments you know, within the superconducting qubi uh, uh, qubits, there's a really optimal value of these two coefficients, or the ratio of these co two coefficients. That is, uh, that for many purposes, you get a good qubit if you have this value be I don't think it's stated here, but 50 or so. Um, <clears throat> in other words, Ej may be 50 times E sub C. And uh, large E sub C needs, uh, uh, I'm sorry, a small E sub C needs a, a large capacitance, and that's why these capacitors tend to be purpose-built and large, so far, far larger than the intrinsic capacitance of this little tunnel junction, this nanometer scale uh, tunnel junction. <clears throat> So I'm not even going to quibble too much with that. Actually, uh, what I'm going to spend some time lecturing on is the rest of this picture, which sounds like the pure engineering part of this picture. Um, not quite, in the sense that I, I, uh, my only addition to this uh, picture was this red dot, because I wanted to make a point that there's, a, there's an important distinction between what's below the red dot and what's above. Um, below the red dot is you know, the kind of pure quantum system. <coughs> And in other words, the system that you're trying to uh, engineer to have good properties, uh, but which is not merely a qubit. It's a qubit connected to this resonator. And so uh, this is, you know, these three elements are the uh, electrical elements that model, or the discrete model that you introduce to discuss that resonator structure. So uh, what features does it have? Well, it has an LC resonator that, uh, whose frequency is the frequency of this, uh, of this uh, um, uh, resonant mode, of this trapped mode inside this uh, resonator. 
Uh, that's all uh, this a part of this Hamiltonian. So it's a harmonic, one harmonic oscillator with funny notation. So this is the momentum p squared over 2m. This is uh, x, uh, kx squared, 1 half kx squared, uh, except not, of course, not a mechanical op oscillator, but an electrical resonator, so that the uh, variables that are introduced are actually a flux variable, as if it were a magnetic flux of this inductor. But it's a, you should think of it as a purely formal variable that just represents the dynamics of this entire collective uh, mode, this uh, full wavelength cosine mode. And then this is uh, Q squared over 2C is the, uh, is the energy of this storage element. Um, <clears throat> but it's you know, the kinetic energy of this oscillator. So it's the Hamiltonian of this that describes the uh, quantum mechanics of single photons or of many photons, multiple photons occupying this cavity. And then the coupling is the cross term here <clears throat> um, involving E sub little c. Little c involves this small coupling capacitor. And what you point to in the picture to say what this coupling capacitor is, is the, uh, the uh, well, basically the gap between the green structure, the uh, uh, green qubit, and the gray or, or blue conductor of the, um, of the uh, of the resonator. <clears throat> so, and then the rest of the structure has to do with the fact that this is a somewhat open system. In other words, there is, uh, there is non-zero tunneling here if you talk about the photons. Photons can tunnel out or there's some transmission coefficient here and here. And so the rest of the world is out here somewhere, out through these coupling capacitors. These are some yet other capacitors in the problem. And then out here is, uh, well, a lot of bad stuff. There's 50 ohms, many you know, sources of dissipation and noise, uh, but also where, where signals come in from uh, in order to interrogate uh, this structure. <clears throat> now, as I said, I'm going to spend a lot of time, or some time, uh, a chunk of this lecture saying why this is, uh, well, in need of improvement. And uh, a little bit about uh, sort of how ad hoc it's been improved and some very recent thoughts about how to really improve it uh, in a more fundamental way. Um, but anyway, this has been a real workhorse. These few lines of algebra have been a you know, sort of tremendous workhorse now for the uh, for this subject because these few steps, which are quite solid, I mean, uh, I'd say more solid than this squiggly equal sign, um, take you through a few steps. First of all, this uh, turns into this, uh, you know, just this term, this uh, uh, number operator for the photons in the cavity with the resonant frequency of that cavity. Um, this is the uh, Hamiltonian, the contributions of this Hamiltonian from just the qubit itself, but in the limit of this cosine being only a weak anharmonicity, so you do a Taylor expansion of this out to the fourth order, and that gives you uh, you know, a qubit which is itself a harmonic oscillator <clears throat> with its own frequency labeled 0, 1, but with a significant uh, nonlinearity, so called duffing nonlinearity, uh, which permits you to single out just a two level system. That is, it becomes possible to address just the lowest two levels, 0, 1, and uh, refer to this entire part of the Hamiltonian as just a z operator, a sigma z operator. Although this is actually this connects with my you know, earlier lecture, I said sometimes we're interested in trits, you know, in quantum three-level systems, and it's not actually so essential. That is, um, you can rewrite this in such a way that you take account of the next level, you know, level labeled number two, for the transmon, and uh, that level's not quite as coherent as the level zero and one, but it's not bad either. And there are one could really put it to some uses, but it's. Uh, it's also possible, uh, you know, that you can construct experiments so that this is an adequate description of everything you do in that experiment, uh, just this two-level uh, description. And then the rest of this, which all is tied up back at the model, at the le electrical model in this capacitor, which therefore is in this cross term of these two um, quantum operators, the number operator of this, uh, the photon number operator on this side and the formal, you know, kind of photon number operator of this as a, itself a resonator um, gets rewritten as uh, 
you know, a, in terms of the creation and destruction operators of these two objects, and then making the two-level system approximation gives you this, and then making the rotating wave approximation gives you that. And then this is the James Cummings model of definitely this, the, the uh, minimal sort of satisfying or, or uh, uh, co complete, uh, uh, logically complete operator, uh, logically complete um, model from which you can build, you know, uh, further scenarios. So when we um, think of a picture like this, <clears throat> I mean, if you talk to a theorist, what's really running around in his mind is a more complex, is a James Cummings style model. That is, this, and, you know, there can be a problem of communication in the sense that sometimes you, you know, maybe you, the experimentalist, is thinking about some aspect of the system that really can't be captured by this James Cummings model. For example, the fact that uh, these resonators have multiple modes of resonance, you know, have higher resonant modes. Um, whereas a theorist will be busy building a model for the effective interaction between this qubit and this qubit based on James Cummings coupling of this to this cavity and then uh, a second James Cummings coupling here. So, I mean, the, um, from a theory point of view, this is sort of a Lego game. That is, you just, uh, um, you know, you put in more qubits and resonators, just write more terms, you know, one term per sort of elementary uh, coupling in that system. Um, and that's been a productive um, approach. I mean, it permits you to build theoretical scenarios and actually rather detailed scenarios for how you would do gate operations in this thing. Uh, but uh, we are increasingly starting to question the, um, you know, the premise or, well, really investigating whether we have to go beyond the James Cummings model in, uh, you know, right from the very beginning here. So, I wanted to give you a little flavor of this, but this is mostly going to be for uh, Thursday. Um, I'm going to stick to the, my own personal policy of not f filling up the entire hour and a half with talking, uh, although I'm getting close already, but no, five more minutes tops at this point. <clears throat> uh, so I, I have a picture here, well, a little bit just for fun, just to remind uh, people that uh, this is, you know, this model building is something you have to consider in itself, oh, I have some automatic advance here that I'll have to uh, deal with. Um, uh, you know, we're, we're in fact in some extremely complex uh, world, and at most this James Cummings model is applying, you know, somewhere, well, to some little aspect of what's, uh, uh, you know, at this level. So uh, I think it's a little bit of a debate how much a theorist really needs to know about all the rest of this. But I, I advocate knowing a reasonable amount, anyway. Um, but I, I don't. I haven't decided what's a reasonable amount. I mean, I'm certain there's stuff there that I don't want to know about. Uh, you know, about the settings of the machine shop instrument that made the screw that holds this together. I don't care. I, I mean, there's some. Oh, should I care? Oh. Oh. Uh, okay, yes. Actually, that was a, I, I never, I didn't follow that up because I thought, well, lab tours at some point, but then I never, uh, I never got back to that thought. Okay, that's, that's nice to know. Um, so, well, that's a sort of open thing, but we'll, we'll organize it. We'll uh, find out when is a good time and, you know, get a group over there sometime. Um, but I still don't care about that screw. Uh, <laughs> but I, I do care, um, I mean, there's, there are like attenuators in here somewhere, and uh, those I care a little, somewhat about. At least I think uh, we should not act in a complete ignorance of those attenuators. Um, there's an instrument that's, well, it's way up, you know, it's in the room, it's not here, that's the signal generator, and that I think we also have, we care about. I mean, we care that it's, you know, one giga sample per second, uh, and other attributes about how it delivers signals into this. Um, <clears throat> There are details about how this actually gets cold that, well, frankly, I haven't cared about, and I don't, uh, maybe I should, no, but I think maybe mostly I shouldn't. I think, uh, I think it's okay to hand off the refrigeration to specialists and say, you make this space cold. And, um, but then when they come back and say, well, this was going to be 10 millikelvin, but it's actually 25, and then it's, then it's allowed to ask why. I think, uh, it's at least allowed to you know, get some idea about what, what's going on 
that makes it not uh, you know, the coldest that it would have been based on the helium-3, helium-4 uh, cycle. Um, so I have here another cartoon, but I'm, I, actually all the rest I'm going to do uh, next time, <clears throat> which is now digging down a little bit closer to these structures. Now what I've done is I've also transitioned, but uh, this is not, uh, well, I, I've introduced another aspect, but it's not to, uh, to go away from the other aspects. So there are, in fact, two styles at the moment in superconducting qubits of how you make them and how you make them coupled to cavities. There's a so-called 2D approach and there's a 3D approach. What the 2D versus 3D refers to the actual structure of the cavity itself. So uh, as I said, you can make cavities, and they're very beautiful in many respects, out of just thin film metal. <coughs> Excuse me. But you can also make them out of metal boxes that have a cavity inside, you know, actual... Uh, 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 empty space inside. And um, this is also a kind of competitive uh, subject. I mean, uh, uh, what I mean is that by putting qubits into, the, into a well-chosen three-dimensional cavity, you can get rather higher coherence times than by any other means. So for applications that require absolutely the highest coherence, at the moment, this is the way to go. And in a sense, the, the 2D cavities are improving. Uh, uh, but it's not clear they'll catch up all the way to these. And then it becomes a question of whether the coherence time is absolutely the crucial criterion for moving forward. That is, if <clears throat> you can only get sufficient coherence to make a quantum computer from 3D cavities, then we'll, we better have, we have to start thinking about how you make th arrays of 3D cavities. And there are people and even startup companies that are uh, pursuing that premise. But if you think that's only a way station to learning more about 2D cavity structures and, uh, and improving them sufficiently so that you can make a quantum computer, then we'll, then we'll never have arrays of 3D cavities. But there are at least experiments where uh, this is some cavity structure, a block of copper that has two slots uh, uh, machined out of it so that when these two structures are brought together like a sandwich, um, you know, brought together like that, that uh, there are two cavity regions, two roughly rectangular cavity regions that are separated by a small, you might say, membrane. Uh, but the point of that is that you can then uh, put little tiny chips into these. They're actually not so tiny, but each chip holding one qubit. And the qubit has a little antenna. That's not really shown in any of these pictures, but it has a little antenna that makes it coupled, Jane's Cummings fashion. Uh, to the uh, now 3D electromagnetic mode. Here's some you know, simulations or pictures of the, of the uh, you know, uh, voltage patterns on the surface of this cavity. <clears throat> and um, so what I'll be dealing with the next time is just a discussion of, uh, uh, you know, is this a Jane's Cummings model? Or in fact, the sort of discrete model that uh, Jane's Cummings is based on, is this actually valid for this uh, structure? Because this, uh, I mean, the engineers, when they make the structure, they do characterizations that look kind of like this. And these are, this is either, I'm not sure what this is in this case, some component, the magnitude of the S matrix on a log scale. S matrix meaning uh, scattering, you know, uh, you measure the reflection or transmission from one port to another <clears throat> as a function of frequency. And you see a lot of structure and dips and things like that. And... Um, uh, this looks like way more than you capture with just, you know, one LC circuit. And um, so that, uh, as I said, is a contemporary question of interest to me of how you really uh, take what's really true at the engineering level about a cavity coupled to outside transmission lines and so forth and turn this into a quantum model without making any ad hoc uh, approximations. So that I will spend time on. Uh, in my next lecture. So I think I will stop there. Um, uh, so that's uh, plenty for one morning. Uh, so you have, uh, uh, well, four more weeks to go, minus half a day of, in the course of the whole year. Um, I hope, uh, well, I'm, I'm around and I'll be happy to discuss any of the issues that I raised this morning. And I'm also sort of running the school, so if anybody doesn't like the cookies, then they should tell me. Uh, and uh, um, so now, uh, well, shortly we could go off to lunch. <clears throat>